Wow, you thought I was giving you thought I was done for the day. Nope, we're just getting started back for a part two of this uh, divisional play playoff recap of the big D podcast. Before I bring in the night special guests, please subscribe, like, and share the Spunky Spectrum Sports Youth page. We can see all the content. Just uploaded a video of my buddy Alice. You can see that. Also check out the Big D podcast on Spotify and Apple. So if you watch Saturday night's NFC Divisional Playoff game, you would see the seeing the San Francisco 49ers break the hearts of all Green Bay Packer fans in a 13 to 10 snow tastic game at Frigid Lambo Field. And joining us to a recap the Packers playoff exit is uh, my buddy Kyle Senner who hosts the uh, Full Press Packer podcast. Kyle, what happened to the Cheeseheads? Well, like you said, they lost. Uh, that that you know, it sucks to say that. Uh, knowing it's the fourth time Aaron Rodgers has lost to the 49ers in the playoffs in his career. Um, and all of them hurt pretty badly. Uh, I suppose you have like just the most two recent, the two with Garoppolo, it's the extreme ends, right? One is the complete blowout. The other one is, oh, victory was right there and, and you lost it. It's so close. Um, I don't know which one hurts worse. I, uh, it's nice to know that they could have won it, that they weren't completely outmatched. Like it's, it's a less depressing feeling maybe later in the off season. Like I still think back to that 2019 game and just, it's, it's just awful that they allowed 200 yards rushing this one. It probably hurts more in the moment. It's almost unbelievable more in the moment. Uh, Probably as time goes on, I think, I don't know. I'll be honest. A lot of people are saying this might be one of their best chances. I don't know. I think, and I think the most obvious reason why they lost this game shows why this, I don't think was meant to be this year. It it was, you know, sometimes you have something that's such a big problem. You, you can't overcome it. And uh, that, that, I think the Packers kind of learned the harsh reality of that. And I got to say the defenses played incredible, both, both of them. I mean, the Packers defense didn't allow a touchdown. They allowed the, the 49ers to get in range to score two field goals. So you can, you, you know, you credit the Packers defense for six points allowed, but you know, that, that should have been enough to win the game, right? Like in theory, uh, cause the offense, the Packers offense scored more than that. Uh, but no, it wasn't meant to be because of another unit. Cause there are three units on, on football teams. And the, I think the Packers management more than anybody has to kind of look at that and, and remember that. I mean, as you stated, uh, I mean, coming into Saturday night's game, Green Bay was, uh, well, Aaron Rodgers was 0-3 against the 49ers. It seems like everybody's got a playoff trip tonight. Forever Peyton Manning couldn't beat Tom Brady. Uh, Tony Romo couldn't beat anyone for forever. And ever. Brett Favre could never beat the uh, Dallas Cowboys or San Francisco 49ers. And Aaron Rodgers still can't beat the Green Bay Packers. I mean, heading into this game, did you feel like history was going to change? Did you feel like this was the time Rodgers was going to get a dub against the Niners? Well, I, you know, going in, it, uh, going into the week, it seemed, you know, maybe one of the better chances. But then there was the news that Bakhtiari didn't practice Tuesday and it came. I mean, they're holding him out that that didn't seem too much of an issue with the Saturday game, but then Wednesday he practiced and okay, good. And then didn't practice again Thursday. That was a little odd. It's like, okay, was it more rest? If it was more rest. Why, you know, it seems like there might've been a setback and then he didn't end up playing. So then when, when we found that out a Saturday that he was, that David Bakhtiari was inactive and that, uh, you know, instead of playing the right tackle, like was expected, Billy Turner had to slide over and play left tackle. I did get a little that 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 did scare me a little. It's like okay, that might make the difference. Uh, you know, Nick Bosa's playing amazing, and uh, Eric Armstead still a force to be reckoned with. Uh, part of me thought there was maybe more hope because of two uh, player differences. 
one of the 49ers losing to Forrest Buckner to free agency. And I, th- and I think his play with the Colts has shown that that contract was well worth it for the Colts to sign. Uh, Buckner has been a, a monster there. I believe he, he was an all pro this year, or he was actually, if he, I, I don't think he made the second team, but he was, I think he was the, the next vote getter. Uh, so if, if he didn't make that second team, he, I think he was right there as maybe like that fifth guy, but certainly one of the best five interior linemen this year is, as a uh, football writer said, but uh, also the Packers, Devontae Campbell. I think that was something I, I thought, and, and Chris Barnes, who also wasn't there in 2019, those, those two linebackers could help contain the run game. And I think, uh, I think I, I was, I wrote an article today uh, for full press coverage and uh, the 49ers as a total gained, I think 115 yards on the ground. Uh, and uh, or something like that. Maybe it was even less than 110. It was something around that, just over 100. And about a third of that was Debo Samuel. And so even that was thinking, okay, they only held Debo to 39 rushing yards. That's probably good considering what he's shown so far, how much of a weapon he could be used. The fact that they held Debo Samuel to, I think it was 83 yards from scrimmage. I know at the end, uh, there was a key, you know, the key game winning drive for the 49ers he ran for a couple of first downs so like unfortunately it was the timing of the yardage but overall it wasn't something like Raheem Mostert the second most rush yards ever in playoff history with 200 and I don't even remember but I don't it doesn't matter because the, the first start of it is 200 uh it, that didn't happen so that was great but yeah I think uh I rambled a lot, which is, I guess, how this game went. It kind of just dragged on without points. And I guess that's the point I have to make. Yeah. You know, San Francisco's running game is the key. San Francisco only rushed for 106 yards. So, I mean, in a game where yards. yards and points were tough to come by, and I mean, limiting a great rushing attack to 106 yards, less than four yards a pop, it's not a good way to win a game. There, I mean, there was a, a point where I think it was like four straight three and outs. And like, so obviously it was like for both teams, right? So like the defenses were, were, were getting at it, but then again, special teams. And I think in a game that was 13-10, as much as, okay, you expect Aaron Rodgers to put a, an Aaron Rodgers offense to put up more than 10 points. And I think there are reasons to, to maybe blame and, and think they should have done better. Again, ultimately, this was an incredible defense. One of the best in the NFL I know they kind of took a downturn last year, but it really has been over the last three, four years, really one of the best units in the NFL. Special teams. Special teams is where it all lies. I mean, frankly. Yeah, yeah. glad you mentioned special teams because it seems like Green Bay's special teams unit has been bad for centuries. And last night, it special teams reeled its ugly head at the worst possible time. Because at the end of the first half, Mason Crawley's has got a makeable field goal. And guess what happened? Jimmy Ward blocked it. And I mean, it was, there were signs. You go back to the 49ers game in the regular season the Packers played. They won on a last-second Crosby field goal. That got close to being blocked. And it was, you know, that was week three. So we didn't really know how bad it was going to be. But yeah, the the you say the last half century really like these last two years, special teams have just been atrocious. I believe in 2020, there were only four return touchdowns all season, whether they were like on special teams, like a kickoff or punt returns, the Packers allowed two of them, like four in the entire league. And, and, and they allowed it twice. And I'm pretty sure one was to the Jaguars. Like this is. You make it, you make it all special teams. You would feel better. And we, we gave up back to back. We gave up kickoff for, Turns on consecutive weekends. <laughs> I mean, I, I wish that was it for the Packers, but it's been a problem all year. And it's, it's, it's almost all aspects of special teams. I mean, so yeah, giving up returns. I think a big problem with that, that I saw this year was just players getting bullied at the point of attack on special teams. Like, like an opposing line, uh, opposing special teams player, just like, taking a Packers special teams player, literally throwing them out of the way, like where, right where the point of attack is going to be. And that's, that's like the player that needs to make the tackle or at least slow up the, the runner and make them, you know, dance around and not get a clear pass so that the rest of the team can come in and, and just like where the, where the key area is, they just could never defend. So that would, that would hurt them on their own returns, not being able to get the, the, the running, the, the runner clearance to the returner clearance to get through. And then it would allow big returns. And then again, blocking whether it's kicks or the, the thing that probably cost the game the most i think was it was about four it was less than five minutes left in the fourth quarter 
in a game that was at that point, it was what, 10 3? Yeah, because it ties the game. They blocked a punt after the Packers went three and out. So, again, you know, unfortunately, again, the offense stalling at, at the worst times, too. Uh, they actually had consecutive three and outs. That one, where the punt, the punt is blocked and immediately returned for a touchdown. They're down, ten, they're tied 10 10. They get the, they have another chance. They go three and out again. And the 49ers get the ball back. They drive down, field goals, time expires, and the game's over 13 10. So, yes, the, you could blame the offense, but man, special teams. In a game that was a three-point game, special teams swung 10-point differential. And, I mean, we would have, you know, a disappointing performance for Rodgers, but could still be moving on right now if not for special teams. And uh, I looked it up. They were the – so I look at Football Outsiders. They do a lot of good uh, m- metrics, the DVOA they, they do, which uh, that stands for def- Defense Adjusted Value Over Average. And basically the Packers special team is worst ranked in the league this year. It was minus 5%. It was five minus 5.2% compared to the average. So if you're a zero, you're a kind of a league average, the Ravens, which well known, one of the best special teams year after year, right? John Har, Yeah. John, I always get tend to miss him up recently. John Harbour, one of the best special teams coaches really of all time came as a special teams coordinator has kept that, Ravens unit saw in that year after year, they were a plus 5.3. So as good as the Ravens are, that's how bad to the below the average the Packers were. I looked it up though, uh, in, in terms of like the worst special teams of all time, because my, my co-host on the full press Packers pod, Jesse Hall and I, we talked about this all, like, is this like the worst special teams ever? Like all year, there's constantly a problem. Um, and I mean, it was the worst this season. Uh, it's not even close to being the worst all time though. There's, it was the 2000 Buffalo bills had a minus 15 DVOA, like football. Yeah, what? I know. I'll have to go back and look like just how awful they were back then. I don't know if, if like returns were more common than they are in the modern era. So like there was more chances to give up touched return touchdowns and they got hit on the average that way. I'll have to go in and look, but like I was looking and like, there are some pretty bad seasons and like the Packers weren't even, anywhere close to the the 10 worst so but it's modern times it's bad but also if i mean like the 2000 bills like well, i guess that's the 99 bills did were in the playoffs so maybe there were expectations i mean if doug flutie wasn't gonna be the quarterback though that probably wasn't gonna happen that's another rant for another time kyle uh but um i looked at i was they also had football outsiders again had an article about historical special teams dvoa and or just historical super bowl dvoas And I looked at the special teams winners from all Super Bowls and the lowest any team had ever had with a special teams DVOA that won a Super Bowl was minus seven. And it was the 1951 Rams, I think it was. But other than that, no team ever won a Super Bowl with as bad a special teams unit as the Packers did as a with a minus 5.3. So if they're going to completely ignore because because I think that's ultimately the problem. That's why I'll end this rant is. It's not like a lot of people are calling, oh, the coaching. How is the coach not fired? They fired their special teams coordinator last year and they hired Maurice Dayton from within, thinking he's this bright young special teams like coaching mind that they want to keep in the organization for the long time. So firing him isn't going to solve anything. The problem is management does not invest in the special teams position. It's they're, they're like, you know, and this is even back before Gudikins, but I think Gudikins has been, that's one of maybe his bigger failures. Uh, I think he's done a lot of good things drafty wise, but I think ignoring special teams from a, a roster build standpoint, it's just, they just took all the backup players there. Okay. You're, you're not, you know, you're not a starter, you're a backup, you're playing special teams and they're not getting players that are excelling on special teams. You look at the Patriots and I guess model franchise, you compare to them, Matthew Slater, like he's, he's been on that team for over a decade now. And as a wide receiver, if he gets five catches a year, that's five catches. You're like, oh, that's extra bonus catches that we didn't expect or aren't paying you for because he's being paid to play every special team snap and, you know, completely excel and dominate. And you don't necessarily need, like, you're obviously doing that with your, your, your long snapper, your, your, your punter and your kicker. Like those guys are just playing special teams. So outside of those three, you usually have you know, eight other players. You don't have to have eight other, like of those higher paid special teams players, but a few of them are, are nice to have the Packers used to have a guy, Jeff Janis, and he was just absolutely great on special teams. He played gunner a lot of the times, uh, sometimes as a returner too. And he was good as a returner, but he was always first man down, make the special teams tackle. There's a couple of years where he was up, up near the, the close to league lead in special teams tackles. And 
they just let him walk. And I, he went to the Browns on a, on like a, a one point, what, like was it just $1.5 million contract or something? It was, it was something around that where the Packers, if they, if they had kept him longer and played well on special teams, that would do well. But like organizationally, it seems like the front office doesn't invest in the team that way. And I think that's a, a major flaw and major issue that, that reared its ugly head in this game. Yeah, it's weird. Uh, I can remember in the late 80s, early 90s with those great Bills teams, Steve Tasco blocking a punt. I mean, I I remember Tasco even blocking a punt in the Super Bowl when the which the Bills lost in uh, Pasadena. I mean, and that's just football. Like, I remember Luke Tasker, st- uh, or the Steve Tasker son, Luke Tasker on the Hamilton Tire Cats, and, and um, they almost won a great cup on, on a return. Uh, the the uh, Brandon Bakes made the return, but there was a legal block in the back, right? So even just like you can be excellent, but you also have to execute well and not take the key penalty on the key return that's going to be a return touchdown to give you the lead late in a great cup to win you a championship, right? So uh, that was 2014. As a Packers fan and and, and Hamilton Tigers Cats fan, 2014 was not very good at all. <laughs> the, that and the Seahawks loss, so like literally two games where it's like the victory's there and you just you coughed it up. So. As a Packers fan, this 49ers loss is bad, but I'll always look to that 2014 loss to Seahawks as probably the worst. So take that as, as for what it will. Just that, that's glad, all my rants about just the special be, teams. Just be, glad, just be glad the fail Mary didn't happen that season. Otherwise, you otherwise you would probably curse Seattle until that until Lemon Field is replaced. Well, again, I mean, you can't even blame Seattle, right? That's and. It's, you can't even blame the refs that were there. It's they shouldn't have been there. You blame the the league entirely. I think that that's the NFL's failing. Uh, <laughs> although I will say, maybe poetic justice, winning that game wouldn't have changed their seating in the standings. And frankly, like even if they hosted that game against the 49ers that year in the playoffs, I'm pretty sure Kaepernick would have. That wasn't the year he set the rushing record. It was the year after, but it, they still had no answer for it. Like in Lambo in San Francisco, that wouldn't have mattered. So ultimately, like, I'm going to say like the fail Mary sucked, but like it didn't really impact anything. That was another year where it just kind of wasn't meant to be for the Packers. The defense wasn't good enough anyway, but honestly, like, I think really these last two years, 2019 and then the run defense was bad, but really 2020 so close against the Bucks, Like that seemed like that was the year where it really could have been their chance more so than this year in 2021. So, as you know, Aaron Rodgers is one of, if not the most publicized quarterbacks in football. It seems like everybody's got an opinion on him, whether you like him or dislike him. We know what Aaron Rodgers has done in the regular season. He's going to win another MVP, shocker. But to me, I don't look at what Rodgers does in the regular season. How can Aaron Rodgers have a 12 and 10 playoff record. I mean, it's still a winning record, right? Like, but I mean, I guess playoffs are tricky. Like how many quarterbacks actually do have winning records? You'd expect more. Um, certainly you look at, again, the winning in the regular season and, and how high of a regard we'd put him. Um, like, I, I don't know about you, Dylan, but to me, he's like, I, 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 he, I think he's like almost inarguably a top 10 all-time quarterback. And you could kind of, varying degrees in that in that top 10 kind of have different arguments where he, he could belong but yeah it, it seems like it should be better than that to be fair but but still playoffs are tough and and you, know, you look at Tom Brady's win loss record in the playoffs it's not really a great measuring stick because it's it's so that that's kind of how insane it is right and I guess it's kind of the reality that Rodgers is never really going to elevate to quite that level and where does he put rank all time ultimately because of that and does it allow for maybe some quarterbacks or certainly and certainly one in particular who are who's playing right now to maybe eventually catch him up catch up to him in the all-time ranks it, it does kind of seem inevitable with uh, Patrick Mahomes going to his fourth straight AFC championship game and if, if he can get a second Super Bowl ring now when it's taken Rodgers and still doesn't have number two right like uh, what does that what does that do for him so that it's more for him about like the the legacy of how high in that list he's going to be. But yeah, I don't know what your thoughts are about his all-time ranking at quarterback, but. I mean, I, I think Aaron is one of the most talented quarterbacks we've ever seen, but I, I, I would say he's been an underachiever because you with a great fan base Packers almost always make the playoffs. 
But yet, how are you one and four in NFC Championship games? How do you only have one Super Bowl? I mean, uh, Nick Foles won the same has won the same amount of Super Bowls as Aaron Rodgers, and uh, Nick Foles is not going to Canton. You know, he might have a, a, a Canton-worthy play, the Philly special. That, that might be a play that gets to the, the Hall of Fame. Uh, but as but as comes. he himself won't be in the Hall yeah, of no. Fame. Yeah, I, I think that's that's pretty clear. But, yeah. yeah, it's winning's tough in the NFL. Like, that's what we got to say with sports. Right? That's that's what makes these championships, like, so great is that they are so difficult to win. And maybe Aaron Rodgers – I think Peyton Manning for the longest time too. Look how, look how long it took him to get his second, right? Right to the end of his hire. I think those two, you maybe look at more than anyone and, and just show just how hard it is to win the Super Bowl. Absolutely. I mean, that's why nobody's repeated since 0304, the 0304 Patriots. But, you know, on Saturday night, Aaron Rodgers did not, played way too conservatively because it seemed like he tried to give Aaron Jones and Devontae Adams the ball because get how many targets Alan Lazard and Randall Cobb got between them. Well, I, I know how many it is, so it would be a bad to ask me to guess. I know it's it's just two, one each. Now, Cobb, I'm not sure how healthy he was, so I'm not too concerned with that, but the way Alan Lazard has been playing lately and I mean, Dominic Daphne got two targets. How does Dominic Daphne has twice as many targets as Alan Lazard? And I mean, he had zero catches. DeGuare targeted him once, zero catches. When Lazard was targeted, it was on third down. It was a it was a, a you know a typical Rogers place ball when they, when there's tight coverage, he'll put it low away. You know, does not want that ball to get intercepted. He's protecting against the turnover, so he's forcing his receivers to go down and make good plays. That's why he targets Adam so much because he knows he can go and make it. Lazard went down, grabbed it. It was, it, it was close to the ground. He really had to, to use proper technique, get his, you know, his arm and hand under the ball, uh, did, you know, got the separation to get open, was at the, the marker at the proper place, got the first down, and that drive kept going. And that was his only target in the game. If you're going to tell me, like, it, anything else offensively, I think that was the biggest failure, was not to get him more involved because that was the most vulnerable part of that 49ers secondary is the, is the outside corners. So I don't understand why you put three targets towards DeGuara and, and Daphne and when, you know, just give – give Lazard four altogether instead and forget those other guys. I know that that's way a lot simpler to, to say than to do obviously, but one target that that seemed like a, a massive mistake to me. So I'm glad you pointed it out because it makes me not seem like the Homer and, and, and go into the Lazard rant. And I look at that and I look at that last third down play. Alan Zolt's wide open, get an easy first down, move the clock and said he, Threw in the double cover with Devontae Adams. Let's see. You've got a six line receiver running across the middle of the field. And yes, Devontae Adams makes double, triple covers, catches look easy. Alan Zollard, Alan Zollard's going to win his match against San Francisco's beat up secondary more often than not. Why not give him a ball to him? He's got the height advantage on anyone. Yeah, and he's been like, making plays, good plays uh, this season. Uh... I think that the, the, the Vikings game, right? And I guess that was, uh, you know, Sean Manning. And so they, you know, what was it to be there? But still got an early touchdown, got them in, in you know, the momentum where they could kind of comfortably advance that game and there wasn't stress. In, and he's, he's, uh, you know, it was slow to start the year, but I think he ended up with five or six touchdowns on the season. And they all came, you know, the last eight, nine weeks of the season. So that this, this stretch he's on has shown that, like I, I kind of went into the 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 off season, and certainly before Randall Cobb was signed, but even afterwards, kind of thinking Lazard to me really is the number two guy because he can maybe he's not the the as quick a field stretcher as Marquez Valdez Scantling, but you know the tough contested catches, the procession receiver, the red zone threat. I think I thought he could do that a lot better, and and really was showing at the end of the season. So really disappointing you know, stat line for him because. He was out there he, making plays. He's a big part of the blocking game too. So he, he plays a ton of snaps. So there's, there's games where his snaps are going to be a lot higher than his targets to what you'd expect to see if he's playing, you know, so, sometimes even more snaps than Devonte Adams does at times because he's so involved in the run game and they want to use him as a blocker so much and maybe not Adams as much when you don't need to. Uh, so it's, you, you, I'm used to some games where he doesn't get targeted as much, but to only see one. Yeah. 
big disappointment. And it's funny. We've spent a lot of time, a lot more time on Lazard and the special teams than the Packers have. But I think that was ultimately the problem in the game. <laughs> how much, I mean, how much blame does Matt LaFleur get? Because we've seen in his first three years as Packer head coach, he's won 13, I think he's won 13 games all three years. If my memory serves me right. 13-3, 13-3, and 13-4. But yet, no Super Bowls. Hmm. Yeah, his his and his playoff record is below 500 because he, he is uh, or no, I guess they would have won two his first year. So I guess he's three and three in playoffs. I think he's I it. think he's two and three, two and three because Green Bay was. Oh, right. Because yeah, they were the two seed, but they were still uh, two seeds. Still got the first round by the, his first year. Yeah. So they've had a first round by every year. So, yeah, uh, divisional round wins against the Seahawks and uh, Rams. Um, and that was Rams with uh, John Walford slash Jared Goff injured finger too. So, uh, but yeah, um, I, I mean, yeah, I think there has to be blame there. I know he in season tried to do some things tangibly in games to help special teams out. Like I remember there was one game and I believe it was one game after they allowed a return touchdown, which is another site this year um, in 2021. I should say, because we're in 2022 now, but, and, and it, it's, it's tough. I'm mean, still saying this season as if the Packers season isn't over and it's all in the past, right? I'm still almost in denial a little bit, but uh, there, there was one game where in the first half, he used two timeouts and they were both on special teams plays. And it didn't seem like it was panic. Like the wrong guys were there. It seemed like it was, okay, let's get the alignment. Let's get as much information to the players as we can and go back out there. Like they're almost, like, like LaFleur was doing everything he could in game as best he could to help out special teams. But it's at a, again, it's at a certain point, it's again, obviously it's not all on special teams. Um, there's, there's some woes on the offense as well. Um, I think for the most part, he deserves tons of credit as a head coach. The one thing I've, com- I've complained about this year is the slow starts to game. And it's weird that that's not what sunk them here. Immediately. The opening drive was great. They had a great game plan. And then no touchdowns the rest of the game. It almost reverted to the Mike McCarthy era, which I I, I think is worse than what LaFleur does. I, I've, I think there's some games this year where Matt LaFleur calls an offensive game plan, not with the intent of the play succeeding. I mean, if they obviously the, like the players are trying to win every play, but the, the main purpose of the early plays in the first quarter is he wants to remove the disguising off the defense. Okay, if we do this, what does the defense do? Okay. If, if they're playing the, 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 the disguise safety look where they're, 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 they're dropping the safety, but then they go up to the box later. Like what does that, they go further away from the box later and, and they kind of play a too deep safety disguise. Okay. What does that look like? And when are they going to show it to us when we run, when, when they're going to show it to us when we pass it, like things like that, where he's trying to get answers to questions in the first quarter more than I want to score the quick touchdown right away. And then, but I think that's why he does, he's, they're so great at making second half adjustments. I think they've been a really good third quarter team this year um, too. So I think that that's really helped. I think coming out and making adjustments really well. So I've preferred that to the Mike McCarthy era, which is a okay, great game plan and then no halftime adjustment. So they, they just, the offense just stalls coming down the second half because the defense figures it out and it becomes really difficult. So I've preferred that like having LaFleur to the McCarthy idea where the, you're not adjusting at all, but this did almost seem like it was okay. We went with the game plan and, and they didn't necessarily adjust as much to what they were doing. Like you're saying, like some of the plays where Lazard was open. And again, and again is that on the floor or is okay. Lazard's open and it's there. It's just Rogers not looking right. So it's tough to also know where to lay blame on that, but you can't absolve anyone from blame. It's a team sport and the coaching is important. So it's, it, it does have to fall on everyone. Again, I think like the defensive players played amazingly. The defensive play calling seemed fine. Uh, so that's maybe the one area where you can absolve blame in this game. Cause I think that, that, that was fantastic. But other than that, you different shades of blame across, but I, I know I've made my point clear that, that, you know, this, this loss, you know, you, there are a few times in the NFL, we could really say special teams lost to this. Okay. Other than like a missed field goal at the end, like the, kind of the obvious way, but this, this one really seems like it. So. There have been a lot of rumors about Aaron Rodgers leaving Green Bay. Do you think Saturday night was his last game as a Green Bay Packer? I'm still basically 50-50 on it. Um, it's I still get down to – it's the numbers, right? I'm, I'm a numbers guy. I always look at the numbers. And 
when they, when he, he came back in August, they restructured the deal in a way where the Packers have more dead cap this year than they would have. I think it would have been 16 million before the restructure to whatever, what, like, whatever they changed it last year. And then it ended up being, I think now it's 26 million of dead cap for 2022. So doing that, the Packers have, so, have given themselves more incentive to want to keep him and not cut him and not have to still eat that dead cap when he's not on the team more so than what would have been the past. So th- before I would have said there was a lot less chance of Rogers coming back. Cause it almost seems like both sides almost wanted that more. Now it's like, I feel like the Packers want him back. The, the organization wants him back. Maybe they admitted the fault on, on Jordan love. Um, so this really does come down to does, does Rogers want to return or not? And that's where I'm, I'm I kind of feel it's 50, 50. Cause I think we kind of, I don't know. You're pretty, I think to be fair, I know this, this comment got a lot of criticism. It's not wrong though. He's a pretty complex fella. And Gudekens mentioned that last year. That's not an untrue statement, right? So any of us trying to think we understand what he thinks or how he thinks or what his approach is, is, is I think a little dangerous. And then maybe I'm just taking the, the law of averages approach and kind of just saying, I, I think it's a 50, 50 split. And we really don't know what, what Aaron Rodgers is thinking, but I, I get the sense it really is up to him. Like the, the, the Packers are going to do whatever they can to bring him back. And it's up to him if he wants to, he, they will, if not, he'll, I, well, it sounds like he might even retire, but certainly the talk was last year that he would kind of or the team would orchestrate, you know, he would orchestrate a, tra- a trade and the team would kind of allow that to trade him to wherever he wanted to go. So I, I, I'd say 50, 50, maybe that makes me an optimistic Packers fan. Cause it seems like the, I know uh, Ian Glendon, our full press coverage editor in chief and, and head hunter there, he, he ran a Twitter poll through the full press coverage account. And I think it was about the three options, right? Return to green Bay, uh, play for another team, retire. And I think it was about 60% of the vote for play for another team to about maybe it was just over a third for uh, return to green Bay. And I guess about a, like, what 10, just over 10% for retire. So the, the consensus of people thinks he's going to leave. I, I say it's closer to 50, 50 than that, but yeah, it's tough to be too optimistic to say more than 50, 50, unfortunately, which is not certainly not where we were last year at, the, at this point. Uh, I know the, the rumors kind of started swirling more towards really kind of close to really just before the draft, like really didn't have any inclination of this with Rogers really before April. And it's going to be fascinating to see what Rodgers and Brady do. I mean, uh, and Brady do because I mean, you match Aaron Rodgers in Denver, uh, Vegas, or heck, Nashville. I mean, the Tides might be thinking we want Aaron Rodgers after what Tannehill did on Saturday night. Um, I mean, I would, I would say the same thing when Brady became a free agent, right? Like. I'm sure, you know, the Bucks. it seems like the Bucks kind of landed him and, and he kind of settled on the Bucks pretty early in the process. But you got to think early on, there had to be half the league that had to say, oh, Tom Brady is available. We have to, we have to inquire because we want him. And I mean, the old, and the, 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 you know, the other half of the league who didn't were, they had young quarterbacks on rookie contracts that looked like they were the next elite players. And okay, no, we're, we've got, we've got that figured out. But the other half of the league that didn't, I think all, went in on that and I would think it's going to be the same this offseason for certainly Aaron Rodgers Russell Wilson if if both are available again that's complicated because with Brady that was free agency any team could could ask him this is trade so you kind of have to go through those teams so that there's a third dynamic it's not just the you know you versus the free agent market and the and the player it's you versus the player but also with the team so you you know there's that there's a third angle there's a there's a middle play uh middle uh man there that has to kind of be appeased as well in terms of the the trade offer in return because as much as you know the, they've said they'll allow rogers to kind of pick his destination if one team massively overpays and maybe it's not rogers preferred destination but he's still willing to go there like if it makes the, the i'm sure the packers will do that same with the, the seahawks again who knows maybe both quarterbacks return it and it's all for naught and then the, the teams that are really looking for quarterbacks are, are really left out to dry so it's it's crazy. These last three years, the quarterback changes we've seen it like, Oh, this is going to be unprecedented. And now it's, is this almost the new norm where it's going to be kind of quarterback carousel? You know, there's, there's maybe 10 teams that are for sure solidified every year. And the, like, you know, like two years in advance, this, this is the quarterback and everyone else it's going to be over the next two, three years going to cycle out their quarterbacks 
consistently. So I wonder if we're going to see a lot of that. And because we, we think back to when, you know, before Rogers most recent deal and before Russell Wilson's big contract, obviously again, before Mahomes and, and Prescott, all that, when like the Derek cars and Matt Staff, Matthew Stafford's of the world, like those guys were the highest paid quarterbacks for a year or two. And like, those were big five, your contracts maybe that they go away teams go away from that and are thinking more two three-year terms on contracts more than anything now and more and all this guaranteed money because it seems like quarterbacks are getting more guaranteed deals i have wondered about that if 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 a team would ever be like confident enough in their player evaluation to say we'll almost like we'll both go like 90 to 95 guaranteed on every contract we have thinking we think all these players are going to be worth rostering that even if we don't want them, we'll be able to trade them. And it's less, it's, it's lesser cap hits than what we're seeing, but it's, it's more guaranteed for the players. I don't know. I wonder if like you, you, you lower those, those total amounts down, I guess, as the, as the salary cap kind of explodes, maybe not. I don't know. Maybe maybe that'll happen someday. I, again, I think it's it's kind of reserved for the quarterbacks, but I do wonder if if other positions are going to start, you know, players are going to start negotiating for more guarantees, less total monies. I, I don't know. Maybe not. Maybe maybe that's maybe I, I'm I'm uh, trying too hard to predict uh, the, the future with crazy predictions here. It's going to be interesting to see what happens with these quarterbacks, Kyle, and. Uh... Hopefully, Green. Hopefully, Rogers is under center in uh, Green Bay next year because otherwise, it's going to be odd seeing Jordan Love play in the center, right? Well, odd. Uh, maybe it's something we have to get used to. But uh, yeah, I don't. I. I mean, it's going to be one of one of the biggest downgrades in quarterback from one year for, to a next for any team ever. I think, and that's. No, I mean, it, it, it is a bit of a remark on Jordan Love, but that's more than anything a comment just on how great Aaron Rodgers is. So again, we're talking about it, but like, you know, a top 10 quarterback who, if he ever wins Super Bowl number two, is he really that much different than Peyton Manning, who I think most people have as a top five quarterback kind of unquestioned? Uh, I would, and I would agree, I would be in that group, right? And, and I mean, if, if Rodgers gets Super Bowl ring number two, whether it's with the Packers or if it's a new team, and they're both sitting at two and, and you look at what they did throughout their careers. It, it, it's, you got to think that one's going to be pretty close. Right. So I don't know. It's, it's interesting to see. Cause again, with, with Rogers, it could be anything. It could be back in green Bay. He could be on a new team. He could, that, that could be his last game ever in the NFL. We just witnessed, which that would be strange if that was the last game. I know. I don't know if anyone would have ever predicted that, right. Regardless of opponent, if you knew that, like, like, you know, you know, you told me you know, even just a couple months ago that, oh, yeah, his last game's good. They're only going to score 10 points. Actually, if you said that, I might have said, oh, God, are they beating the 49ers in the playoffs again? <laughs> it, it sure enough, it was. But, you know, to, I guess to lose at 13 10 is, is the, the, you wouldn't think like if you, okay, if they only scored 10 points, they would have got completely stomped where they lost it 35 10 again or something like that, where they just were no match defensively and, and they just had, didn't have an answer. Not, oh, yeah, they, defense dominated completely and the offense cost them and they only scored 10 right that that i guess is unexpected to, to see for aaron Rodgers, right we haven't really had too many of those it's it's always been there's been special teams mistakes in the past right i guess we all know brandon bostick we all know what happened in this game here um or you know poor defenses whether it's allowing colin kaepernick or raheem mostert again it's always the 49ers those guys to run for a lot of yards um but it's never like Rodgers has never really been at fault. Like I think, you know, the, the, when they lost the Falcons in the NFC championship game, that was, that was a bit player execution, but I mean, that cornerback group had no business covering anybody. Um, I remember when they drafted Kevin King the next year, I was rejoicing and le for legit reason, because Kevin King instantly became the best cornerback in that room when it was Demarius Randall, Quinton Rollins and Ladarius Gunter. With that oh, trio God. of cornerbacks having to, to stop, none of them could stop Julio. I think they, they basically centered on, okay, Gunter's the tallest, so he'll cover Julio, but like none of them had a chance. But like there was, like that was again a, a, a cornerback group that was never kind of meant to win a Super Bowl. Like you, you'd never be able to stop any of the elite offenses. They did beat Dallas that year. Um, I mean, they didn't stop Dez from catching at that time and, and the Packers still won. So for that's, that's one last rant I'll say for the, the, the Dez caught at people in 2014, 
you know, okay, cool. Catch it, not catch it. Cowboys still lost and Cowboys still would have lost because they showed in 2016 exactly what happened when Dez caught it almost at the same time in the game too. touchdown with about four minutes left in the game and result the same Packers still won. So uh, that, that, that's, that's, that's how I'll, maybe a stamp I'll end there on, on some Cowboy fans. Uh, although both, both the Cowboys and Packers won zero playoff games this year. So I guess I don't really have any, uh, anything to say to Cowboys fans this year. They both lost the 49ers some unity, if anything, uh, Mike McCarthy too. So that's kind of funny. Yeah, Mike McCarthy loses. Mike McCarthy's new annual team loses in the playoffs. Why am I shocked? <laughs> Thanks for hopping on, Kyle, and uh, we wish you pack as well in the off season, and uh, hopefully there'll be uh, plenty of Aaron Rodgers touchdowns to come. Well, thank you, Dylan, uh, for all the well wishes, and also for sure for having me on, giving me the platform to let people hear my voice and <laughs> letting me uh, talk so much of my rants. And <laughs> uh, I appreciate it very much.